Well, hello, hello, hello everybody. Uh, and welcome to, to this new cycle of conferences in the seminar. We are so happy to having you and to having you in person. You know, it's kind of different. So we are going to try a hybrid mode this, this fall and, and, the, and the next winter. So thanks for joining us. Uh, our, our seminar today, and welcome to the 2002 cycle of conference. Before we start, I'd like to remember everybody to please put your electronic device on silent mode and be ready to participate in the question and answer uh, session that we are going to have at the end. Uh, we will also circulate an attendance shift. Please, regarding the attendance in the part that say name, write your name in the more clear way. Okay, uh, I know you can and we all can. So as a little announcement, uh, we have some sessions available for students' participation. If you want to share your research with your partners, please let us know. Send us an email and we can try to figure out and find a space for you. So for today's, se for today's session, we are going to uh, be, we are going to review the, the understanding uh, expand your understanding of pressure meter testing. So a uh, sheet of paper has a thickness of about 0.1 millimeters. Direct shear uh, strain pressure meters can reliable measure changes in displacement more than 100 times smaller than this, about the wavelength of infrared light. In a practical sense, this level of resolution allows the shear strength and shear strain response of the group of B determined for shear strains of less of 0.01% to over 25%. This permit a high precision a assessment of ground condition ranging from competent rock to very soft soil. A direct strain pressure meter is an instrument that holds tool measuring pressure and displacement, allowing for calculation of engineering parameters, including the stiffness, strength, and in situ stresses. This talk will include a discussion on the following, an introduction to direct strain para, uh, pressure meters, an explanation of how testing is carried out, an outline of the theory in which the data analysis is based, and an overview of how this analysis is uh, undertaken in real world context. Now, our speaker for today is our guest, Yasmin. Uh, she is a senior engineer with Cambridge in situ and has a degree in mining engineering and a background in consulting with a specialization in rock mechanics. Her focus recently has been looking toward better understanding cavity contraction and observed fracture responses. Since being at Cambridge in situ, she has worked extensively in Canada, the United Kingdom and internationally. He has been involved in all aspects of cavity expansion testing from the development of the equipment to design of test procedure to the processing of data and interpretation of results. So please join me in this conference and please enjoy. Oh, thanks guys for being here and thank you everyone online. Um, yeah, Yasmin here. This is my first lecture at a university, so I'm slightly terrified. <laughs> but yeah, so today what we're gonna talk about is what is a pressure meter? I think most of you have some awareness from the degree course that's going on, um, but we'll go into a bit more detail. We'll talk about different sorts of equipment, um, the equipment that I know about. I only work in direct strain pressure meters. Maynard style pressure meters are also very common in Canada, particularly in the more French speaking areas of Canada. So you might've come across them more often. Um, then we'll talk about the theory of cavity expansion testing, which will test my soil mechanics knowledge, being a rock mechanics specialist. Um, and then we will talk about the reality of testing and the analysis and how we actually look at the data based on pure theory to what actually exists. Well, what have I done wrong? Uh, no, nothing. I guess <laughs> people from the sky cannot see the... Uh... People can't see the slides on Zoom. No. <laughs> so 
what no worries. We are working on that. Just one minute. It shouldn't be difficult. It shouldn't be difficult. Yeah. All good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pleased that I have to touch the computer. <laughs> Uh, we could just change the view on here as well. Oh no, there we are. Ah, we're all good now? Perfect. Um, so yeah, overview of what we'll talk about. Um, yeah, reality, proper analysis. I've got an example test we'll go through so I can explain what we do and why it's based in pure engineering theory rather than empirical correlations or anything complex. We do really simple maths. Given a sheet of paper and half an afternoon of no stress, you guys will be able to do all the maths we do. It isn't complex. Um, and then just the practical considerations. So where should we be using this testing? Is it going to be in gravel? No, <laughs> but you can work in rock and really soft soils and everything in between, but maybe it's not appropriate for a single story house. It's gonna be for big civil structures normally. So talking about that, come on computer. So what is a pressure meter? In the simplest sense, it is a downhole instrumented probe um, that directly measures pressure and displacement. So there's a flexible membrane covering the instrument and that's inflated with normally compressed air and the resulting movements recorded. This um, picture on the right, the picture of the probe without the membrane on shows the arms, which in a direct strain pressure meter measure your displacement. Um, the total pressure cell, which in a direct pressure meter is all down hole and measuring pressure. So this is what goes down the hole um, and all the electronics are down hole and you've got that seal, which is keeping pressure out of the electronic zone because if you're pressurizing your electronics, things aren't gonna go well, your data is gonna go a bit squiffy. Um, and then also on this example, so one of the direct strain pressure meters I work with regularly has poor pressure cells. So you can record the poor water response while applying pressure and recording displacement. So you can start looking at how a material responds to loading. And that can become very powerful if you're interested in something like liquefaction. If you're thinking that it's excess poor water pressure is gonna be generated when the pressure is held constant. So poor pressure cells are useful. But yeah, pressure meter is just a fancy balloon really, um, that's very well instrumented. Um, just the difference between the pressure meters I'm talking about, the Cambridge style direct strain pressure meters. Um, I think University of Alberta might have a direct strain pressure meter as well. Not sure. Yes, good. <laughs> um, which I think is similar to the Cambridge style pressure meter. Um, but the difference between Cambridge style and Maynard style is the strain gauges. So these are in for the arms. They're about the size of your little finger um, and they're weak stone bridge circuits. So you're managing to record with very high precision a voltage that occurs across um, the arm movement. <clears throat> we have a resolution of about 0.1 microns. Um, displacement and about 0.1 kPa pressure. Um, so direct strain pressure meters, it is a direct strain measurement. It's not volumetric. So you get that high resolution data. Your results, you can then see when they're influenced by insertion disturbance, but that means you can take that data that's influenced out and get results that aren't influenced by that insertion disturbance, assuming a test is successful. <laughs> Um, multiple stiffness readings, strength and stress. However, the disadvantage of direct strain pressure meters is testing is more challenging and complex than the Maynard style pressure meter. Data can be more challenging to work with, which if you've got a simple engineering solution might be actually a disadvantage to what you're trying to do. Um, and it's normally a more expensive technique. The Maynard style and 
I think there's probably a bit more of a potential for things to go wrong with a direct strain pressure meter than a Maynard style pressure meter. I don't know much about Maynard style pressure meters, so I'm not going to talk about them any further. So, three common types of pressure meter I work with um, small, large, and medium. <laughs> um, so, the RPM, reaming pressure meter, can also be deployed with a live cone and become a cone pressure meter. Um, 47 millimeters is very convenient because it fits down a cone hole, it fits into an SPT pocket. Um, so you can use it in the push sense. So if you're placing it into a cone hole, pushing it with a cone on, or placing it into a SPT pocket, or you can drill out a little pocket down the hole. Um, so all of these tools, I should have said before, are used in a borehole. <laughs> um, so you create that borehole and then you create a pocket to place the pressure meter in. The self-boring pressure meter, the one at the bottom, has this cutting shoe. It's like a little mini tunnel boring machine and creates its own pocket while supporting the ground. Um, it's more like an apple borer than a tunnel boring machine. Um, and that cutting shoe is razor sharp and cuts through the ground without causing disturbance. Um, and then, yeah, the larger probe, which works at higher stresses, um, so that can be taken up to 20 MPA, um, is used in pre bore pockets. So it's whether you bore a pocket, push something in to create a pocket, or self-bore it. That's the only difference between these tools and the size hole they need to work in. So just a bit of a display of different sizes and maybe it's a bit clearer to see the section. That black section is the flexible rubber membrane that is where we expand the tool. And you've got bits and bobs either side which contain electronics, various things like that that make the instrument work. And it has underneath that metal bit, uh, that rubber bit, it has a metal core where the arms sit um, and the pressure cells sit. So, equipment operations. <laughs> um, everything has to be calibrated. So, you can't use an uncalibrated pressure meter. There's no point using an uncalibrated tool. You need to be calibrating the membrane. So, you need to know how that rubber membrane behaves with pressure. Um, you need to know its stiffness and it's zero, it's lift off values. And you also need to know, particularly if you're working in rock and you're taking the tooling up to really high stresses, you need to be having a good knowledge of what's going on with the stiffness of the system. So once you start putting 20 MPA of pressure into these tools, they actually ever so slightly laterally extrude. <laughs> um, so calibrating the system, understanding how it responds at those high pressures is key. Um, then it's getting it in the ground. So you've created your borehole, you lower this tool down on rods, on wire lines sometimes, um, you lower it down and you either place it in the pocket you've already created or it self pours itself in. You carry out the test, which I've liberated a picture that Anna created actually um, <laughs> from site. Um, so carrying out the test, what we have on surface is a laptop with a live feed coming from the test where the data is converted into pressure and displacement. And the operator who's manually doing the test can see how the ground is responding and choose to stop adding pressure, release pressure, or terminate the test for whatever reason. And he's adding pressure and releasing pressure based on what he's seeing on his laptop screen um, with this panel here which has a regulator, various valves, which allow air to go in, air to stop going in, <laughs> air to go out. Um, and yeah, data comes up via, so we the probe's attached to an umbilical cord, um, which allows pressure to go down and the electrical data to come up. Um, and then that's all converted in the software we use. Um, and then yeah, test terminated. Pressure meter testing needs to terminate and it will either be Strain control, so you've reached the maximum displacement of the test. Stress controlled, which means you've reached the maximum stress the instrument can take. You don't want to go outside those compliance values or you're gonna damage your tooling and it won't have been appropriately calibrated. Um, and yeah, sometimes bursts happen. So that flexible rubber membrane can explode is a bit of a strong statement, but rupture, um, be that from sharps in the ground. So if you're testing 
say, a glacial till with gravels in, that gravel can poke through that rubber membrane. Or if you're testing in rock, you might have a, a pocket where a fracture's moved, so you've got a bit of soft ground against the borehole wall, and if you've got non-uniform expansion and you've got a bulge, that's probably going to rupture. Um, it's normally bad luck and a bit of the geology's fault. <clears throat> okay, so those are the practical bits. More on the theory as to how pressure meters work. Um, so you're probably all far better at soil mechanics than me, but here we go. So a bit of imagination is required here. Um, on the left, that side, <laughs> um, we have what is a vertical view down a borehole. So we're imagining that we've had a perfect installation. We've caused no ground disturbance from the tooling. Um, our cavity, RC, is exactly the same radius as our instrument, RO. Um, and we're looking at point A, which is a point in the cavity wall. So perfect installation never happens. This is all completely theoretical. Um, and then the picture on the right is the, a graph with radial stress on the y-axis and hoop stress, circumferential stress on the x. And it's looking at how, yeah, it's how stresses change as we load and unload the material. So as gas is put into the pressure meter and the tool is pressurized, um, we load the ground elastically first. So the ground is gonna respond elastically first. Um, up to the point of failure, and then you get plastic um, plastic behaviour at the cavity wall. You've got elastic behaviour away from the cavity wall, but we're not seeing that with the tooling. Um, and we take that up to our max, our maximum, maximum radius, take it up to our maximum pressure. Um, and then what we do after reaching maximum pressure is we release pressure from the tool and you're looking at the reverse behavior. So as we release pressure, you can look at everything in reverse. So you can use the cavity contraction to look at the data. And it's, it's my preferred way of looking at data because it's gonna be less disturbed because you haven't had to put the tooling in the ground. Um, you've created something that you know where its turnaround point is and its origin. So first of all, elastic unloading happens up to the point of failure. So that reverse failure and then you get that plastic unloading as well, which is key for determining strength. I think I managed that fairly well. Um, and you can see there's obviously a bit of a difference in the cavity radius when we terminate the test um, and the original radius, the origin radius. And that's just because of the plastic behavior. Um, after that, we'll see the membrane collapsing on the probe. So that flexible rubber membrane, we'll see that collapsing normally at where the ambient pore water pressure is. So it's a useful way if you've not got any groundwater monitoring to get a, I'll say, guesstimate of the pore water pressure, having decent pore water um, monitoring, eh, groundwater monitoring installed is a far better option. So it's, it's actually measured and you know it, but if you've got a site where the borehole's collapsed after testing, it's a good way to approximate things doesn't work for materials that aren't having standard groundwater. So if you've got, um, say an oil sands deposit, that the groundwater's weird and wonderful. Um, so that's not as easy. So that's the theory. <laughs> I'm gonna just run a video of a test, so it's very, very sped up. A standard self boil pressure meter test, which is an example of, takes about 30 minutes normally to an hour, depending on how strong the ground is, what you're testing. Um, probably takes about half an hour to drill in the probe as well. So to create that self boil pocket, use that mini tunnel boring machine, takes about half an hour from that, um, assuming you don't have any hard layers that create refusal. Um, so this on the screen, um, your x-axis here is displacement and your y-axis is pressure. This is live calibrated data recorded from the probe. All of the horrible data points spread across here 
is the data we record while we drill the instrumentation in. And it's very important to record that data. So you know, kind of you know what's gone on during drilling. So you know if you've you have to wiggle the probe a little bit to get maybe through a, a challenging band to drill through. Maybe you had a slightly too large, little teeny tiny bit of gravel, something like that. Um, here we can see that it's been drilled in pretty cleanly. Um, the y-axis pressure change is free KPA. So we've not created lots of excess pressure during drilling. Um, but we've observed at least. <laughs> um, we're looking at three sets of arm pairs. So the self-boring pressure meter has six arms in total spread equidistantly around the radius, or the one I'm talking about does, the Cambridge one does. Um, we're looking at those three arm pairs, just there on the three axes of symmetry. It's a nice way to visualize data and how the data varies across the probe. Um, yeah, so, oh, come on, play. So yeah, a couple of more drilling data points. And then we start to add pressure. So here we're adding pressure and we're not actually seeing any displacement. This is because we're below the in-situ horizontal stress. So even while we're doing a test, during the live testing with a pressure meter, you can start to see things like the in-situ horizontal stress. So um, yeah, so no movement. And then you start to get movement occur. So we've overcome the in-situ horizontal stress um, about, it's not very easy to see here, but about 500 kPa. Um, that's when you started to get radial displacement occur. Um, we've overcome that. We actually have also now overcome the elastic plastic boundary. So at 900 kPa, you can see how it's pretty linear before 900 kPa, and then the gradient starts to change. That's just, you've passed through that elastic phase and you're in that plastic phase now. Um, and then we take creep readings and we unload and reload the pressure. Meter. So we're, we're playing with that, um, those boundaries, those stress boundaries. And as you unload, you've got elastic behavior coming back and then you reload and you're pushing that boundary ever outwards. So yeah, you're doing two cycles on the loading normally, creep hold before the contraction, um, and then a cycle on the unloading to see how, that's also allowing you to see how uh, stiffness varies with stress level. Um, creep holds are important to give yourself clean data. Without those creep holds, you might have loading based, like sort of stress based impacts on your stiffness data. So all key things to look out for if you're ever doing pressure meter testing or in the more likely scenario, you're supervising it on site or you're looking at pressure meter test data and you want to check that it's decent quality data. Um, Come on. So that was a live test. This is the data we get into the analysis team. Um, we look at the average arms normally because it's, it's simplest and it's probably most representative of the general ground behavior. Occasionally we'll look at arm pairs or the odd and even axes. This can be that you've damaged an arm of the pressure meter and the data is erroneous, so you can exclude that. Or if you're working in a really weird stress environment where you've got that um, lateral stress anisotropy, or maybe even lateral stress, uh, lateral strength anisotropy, um, say you're working in something with a very high angled bedding plane, like a rock with a 70 degree bedding plane, you might end up looking at different arm pairs of the pressure meter to look at how the strength of the ground is changing with orientation. But keeping it simple here. Um, so the first thing we do is we work out which data to ignore. So working out, well, we'll take the creep data out for this soil test because that's just a cleaning process rather than anything really useful for, for analysis when testing soil. We take the stress rebound data out because it's just gonna confuse matters. We identify where our cavity contraction starts. So where our maximum radius and pressure is where our turnaround point of the test is. And we make sure we ignore data post-membrane collapse. So once you drop below the ambient pore water pressure, you're just gonna get membrane effects clouding your data. So it's, it's a cleaning process. And when we identify the unload reload parts of the cycles which are used for stiffness. 
and we also identify any weirdness. So that bit at the start of the test, that shouldn't happen. Um, it's a green circle for everyone on Zoom. Um, and yeah, so identifying that nice and early on, keeping that in the back of your mind to think, shouldn't be there, what's causing this? Um, this is this is a project where we were about three meters from the toe of a really big retaining wall. Um, and that's what caused this jump here. Um, stiffness, simplest thing you can get out of pressure meter test if you've got pressure and displacement. Super simple. Um, first way of looking at it is your initial stiffness and your linear stiffness. Um, this is a clayish material. Um, they're all the same gradient. It's a good sense check. Um, it should all be the same gradient if you're in a clay or you're doing something wrong. Um, linear stiffness. So I've expanded one of those cycles. Um, first thing you can see is it isn't a straight line. It isn't truly linear. And as we all know, soils are non-linear. So this is an easy way to assess the stiffness of the ground. But it's not really that representative of what's going on in that soil. So we apply a power law to get a constant, an alpha value and a beta, um, looking at data on log log scales to get a nonlinear representation of stiffness. This is where it starts to get exciting. Um, so the test example we had, um, had three cycles. Cycle one is the black cycle, cycle two is the red cycle, and cycle three is a blue cycle. So all of these cycles were taken at different stress levels. Um, they're all kind of plotting in the same place. If this was a true, oh, and on the y-axis here, we've got shear modulus, and on the x-axis, we've got um, natural, it's a log axis, but it's shear strain. Um, so if we were in a truly undrained soil, we'd expect to see um, our yield strain in excess of 1% shear strain. Um, and we'd expect to be seeing stiffness to remain basically constant with stress levels. So these cycles were taken at different stress levels. They were taken at, I don't think they were taken, they were taken at 500 kPa, one kPa, and uh, not one kPa, one MPa and two MPa, for example. And you don't see variation in stiffness with that stress level indicating constant volume conditions, indicating this materials uh, behaving in an undrained manner. If your soil is drained, you see quite a different response. You've got a yield strain of about 0.3% and your stiffness is varying with stress level. So as you take cycles at higher stress levels, you see a different response. Um, so on our example, we can see our yield strain is somewhere around about here. Oh, my mouse isn't appearing on the big screen. It will be <sighs> log scales and reading off a graph. Um, probably be somewhere about 0.8% shear strain. Um, so right on the right of that axis where the data is falling off the curve, where you lose the trend. Um, and you can see that most of those cycles are plotting in the same sort of place. Um, indicates it's a silt or maybe a clay silt, which in the London clay is how we expect the ground to behave. So I'm going to speed through these, otherwise it's going to be death by graph. Um, in situ lateral stress, again, we're looking at lots of different techniques. So the whole point of pressure meters is data repetition. From one test at one interval, you get three, four readings of stiffness. You'll do that for the in situ stress and the strength. So it's repeatable values for stiffness, strength, and stress. You're building up a picture of what's going on in the ground. So we firstly look at where we start to get movement, radial displacement occur. Um, and that's simply the arms lifting off. You've overcome the native stress of the ground. We look at our yield stress and back calculate what our in situ stress is from there. Um, it's not a great example, I'm afraid, but that's the reality of testing. You can see that little jump at the bottom is something's going on in the ground. We've got a bit of disturbance, so we're not, we're not fitting very well here. We look at the poor water pressure response. So 
Um, when we start to get an onset of excess pore water pressure, so our gradient starts to increase, that is an indicator we've overcome the in-situ lateral stress. Um, and then we can also spot the yield stress from the pore water pressure response. Sorry, give me a moment. Okie dokie. So just some different examples for this sort of soil. Analysis techniques vary dependent on if you're looking at sand or clay, just as you'd expect your lab testing to vary. Um, your strength. Um, again, we start by looking at the cavity contraction because it's the least disturbed data. Um, just two different examples, looking at the data in a different way to get an undrained shear strength. And then we look at the expansion. We have to assume an origin point. Um, but again, we're looking at or either gradient fitting or plateau fitting, trying to tie the data together. You do get a bit of variation across techniques, but I don't think that's wildly unexpected. Soil is a complex material. You're making assumptions here that you're testing something homogeneous. And in reality, how often it, is it that you get a box of core that's exactly the same? Um, so that little bit of natural variation, I think, invalidates or it can cause this sort of variation. So the ideal point to select plateau might have been on the, the gray graph, might have been marginally higher, but to tie the two together to give the same value, we've picked that position. And then the final thing we do is curve fit. So curve fitting is a direct strain pressure meter big thing. It's proof that everything you've done, the in-situ lateral stress, the stiffness and the strength are true because you're able to reproduce the field curve. If you can't reproduce your field curve, you've done something wrong. So, little video here. So the first thing, is it gonna play? Yeah, first thing with a curve fit, you need to, you need to pick your start point somewhere sensible so to match the data. And then what I'm doing here is matching the unloading data so I know what the undrained shear strength from the unloading is. I'm matching that to the loading data. So I'm applying the same undrained shear strength to the entire test. Um, and then I know what my value range for my in-situ horizontal stress is. So I'm still fiddling with my strain origin slightly just to tie together my strengths. Um, I do spend longer than this if I'm actually doing the analysis. Um, it takes me about 10, 10 minutes or so to do a proper curve fit and to fine tune it. Um, and then, yeah, P0 is the in-situ horizontal stress and just tying that to fit with the curve fit. It is marginally higher than the rest of the observed in-situ horizontal stresses I got, but that makes sense because we've got that disturbance at the start which indicates the ground having relaxed. So we will, have, we will have lost being able to see, say, 10 kPa of in situ horizontal stress. Sometimes you might push the probing a little bit, so put a little bit too much down force on, and you'll see a higher than representative in situ stress in the observed techniques, and your curve fit will come out a bit lower. But the whole point of the analysis is applying lots of different techniques to look at the data in different ways, to get the same numbers to make sure it's repeatable and it's valid, it's representative. I've got time, haven't I? I'm going to skim through competent rock because it's what I'm passionate about and I'm hoping there's people who like rock mechanics in the room or on the line. Um, just it's a different material to engineering than soil, as I'm sure we all know. Um, and we don't see shear failure here. So shear failure is key for most of our analysis techniques with a pressure meter, and you're unable to solve the boundary problems and you can't curve fit if you've not got that shear failure. You do exceed the tensile strength and you'll see tensile failure probably unless you've done a really bad job of coring to create your pocket. Um, and yeah, I'd say less than one millimeter of displacement across the test is common. So just a little bit of an expanded view, you can see it's a very straight line event. Um, we've not got that distinctive curvature over that we had in the video display I had. It's a very different shape. 
cycles show a hint of non-linearity in there. Um, it's mudstone, so it's not wildly unexpected. Um, but when you start comparing it, yeah, to either a weathered rock example, which is what yellow points are, um, or a sand example, you can see it's very different behavior. You're not going to be able to apply the same models. Weathered rock, we can just about apply a sand model. Um, you do have to make considerations for the tensile strength a weathered rock will have, um, but you can apply similar models to drain cohesion to get to get through that. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so determining principal stresses becomes interesting. Um, this is mainly in here because I did a paper on it about two weeks ago, um, so I know it. <laughs> um, determination of principal stresses. Um, stiffness is easy for a rock test because it's going to be linear, mostly. Um, but to look at the principal stresses, because you can't curve fit, because you can't back calculate from the yield stress, um, you have to start looking at the tensile limit stress. So the theory is on the left, the reality is on the right um, of those crack responses we see when we exceed the tensile stress um, from looking at creep data. Um, but this is what we were using before. Um, and we developed the need for a targeted test that could work in competent rock. I've partially included this um, in here because Colin, who Colin Dredger, um, who initially invited me here, was involved in the initial conception work and ideas um, for looking at the cavity contraction creep information. Um, so taking creep readings, so holding the pressure doing lots of different pressure steps during contraction and from that you're able to look at the rate of change in creep so you're able to look at yeah how your creep magnitude and your creep rate changes so looking for inflection points and zero rates of change so what's going on with your creep rate at a constant pressure based on theory that if you're at your in situ horizontal stress, so your major in situ horizontal stress, your creep rate will be constant. If you're holding there, you won't be changing, the creep rate won't be changing. It will be under in situ conditions. It won't want to be doing anything weird and wonderful. It'll be at its minimum. Um, yeah, um, and just a little example showing you've got a very clear zone of inflection points occurring. Um, probably you've also got your minor horizontal stress at about 1 MPA, and you've got your major at about 1.2 MPA here, um, which is as expected on this site. Um, yeah, so just a quick little observational technique. Analysis over, death by graph stuff. Um, <laughs> practical considerations. So this is probably key for if you're wanting to get involved, if you're wanting to use pressure meters if you've got a site that understanding the in situ horizontal stress is important or getting good friction properties of sand is important, you need to be having some practical considerations, which are what are the expected ground conditions. Pressure meters do not work in gravel. Um, if you've got a gravel site, a really, or a very gravelly soil, they're not gonna work very well. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then it's about what results you're seeking. So there's a bit of a, a self-boring pressure meter is best because it causes the least disturbance reputation that goes on. That isn't actually true. If you're just on a small, simple site with quite a tight budget, what's gonna be more important is getting lots of tests. Self-boring pressure meter has a chance of refusing as well. So actually doing, say push testing and self bore pressure meter, uh, push testing in SPT pockets, it's probably going to be a more suitable option than self-boring if you're only after simple stiffness data. If you're more interested in getting perfect values for in situ horizontal stress in a dam structure, for example, then it's going to be key to be using something like a self bore pressure meter because that's going to give you the most chance of getting a good set 
of stress readings that you're going to have high amounts of confidence in. And it's that confidence versus test efficiency. Do you want something quick and simple? And it might even be that something like a Maynard pressure meter is a great tool if you're after simple things like Maynard modulus, so a simple stiffness, and your Maynard limit pressure. So that might be the more appropriate tool than, yeah, than a self boring pressure meter because your design doesn't need it. So yeah, it's all about matching the testing and the tooling you're using to what your design needs or your research needs are. Um, I realize I'm talking to students, researchers, rather than <laughs> civil engineers and geotechnical engineers who work in the consultant world here. But yeah, I hope that's been interesting. I hope I've taught you something or explained something new to you. Um, yeah. <laughs> I explain things clearly it's it's a topic that I've spent four years working in quite intensively and I know it's a niche field within a niche field and yeah and I might be using British things terminology for things rather than Canadian thank you, hey, uh, thank you very much uh, engineer Byrne so now we are going to open the session for, for questions. So please, if someone has a question, just raise your hand and I go, I'm going to go with a mic. Any question? Okay, give me a wait. A because you know the problem is if you don't have the mic, people will need to a question so so the sensor it sits flush with the <laughs> okay um so the sensor sits flush with the borehole wall correct so not exactly okay so the sense i should have brought i should have brought a demo probe they're just really heavy is the problem so let me go back through my slides there's also what board markers yeah. Sorry, everyone. Take me a moment. So the sensors. Apologies for everyone on Zoom. The sensors, these arms, and the pressure, the TPC, sit on the inside of a flexible rubber membrane. The PPC, we have a porous stone that goes through that membrane, and the pressure, the PPC diaphragm or pressure diaphragm, it sits behind that. So that, it isn't flush with the ball hole, but you've just got a porous stone in between. So that's as flush as you can get, really. The rubber membrane we have sits over those sensors. So what's really important is calibrating to know the properties of that rubber membrane. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what you're going to have is just going to be readings on the inside. If you don't properly calibrate that rubber membrane, because you're measuring on the inside of that rubber membrane. For a pressure, it's not such a big problem. Um, but displacement, you need to know about membrane thinning. You need to know about the stiffness of the membrane. Um, yeah, so they don't sit directly flush to answer your question. Okay. But mathematic, just simple maths considerations are done to calibrate out the influence of the rubber membrane. Okay, so when when it's being installed in the hole, yeah. So whether so, like if you have a tight fit, where say it's just a few millimeters, or versus you know a few centimeters. Yep. Do you see that affecting the the performance of the test quality data? Um. Yes. So, um, the HPD, for example, that will have a maximum radial expansion capacity of 20 millimeters um so if we're flush it's good because it means that we're able to expand it more in the soil so say you had a really you were testing a soil here and you've done a really oversized pocket or it collapsed a bit we're going to see the disturbance from that soil movement from poor quality drilling um and with these pre-board tests, you have to expand the pressure meter out past that zone of disturbance. Right. So if it's not this ideal case, 
you've probably got a zone of plastic disturbance sat somewhere out here. Right. Um, so you're going to have to expand the radius of the probe past that plastic disturbance to start seeing behavior of the ground that's mm -hmm. true, right. rather than you've drilled a hole, the drillers have gone for a cup of tea and a sausage roll, okay. um, <laughs> and then you get the probe down the ground and it takes half an hour to trip the probe in if you're testing somewhere really deep, for example. Yeah. And the ground will have had, if it's pre ball pocket, quite a bit of time to relax. So you have to get past that plastic zone of disturbance and test. So that's why 20 mils is important. And the bigger the pocket, the poorer quality the pocket, the poorer quality the drilling, the greater this is going to be, unless you're going to have a clean test. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you're testing a rock, the more oversized your pocket, the less pressure you can take the probe up to. So if your pocket's five mil oversized, it's gonna, you're gonna increase your risk of burst significantly. And we're quite, I know Stuart's on the line, but we're quite fussy about pocket size and pocket quality, because there's no point doing a test, getting the data back to the office and just looking at your testing. We've done it before where we've tested drilling mud rather than the ground. Oh, um, yeah. We can see it quite quickly. And we can terminate the test quite quickly, but if the pocket's really poor quality, we just don't connect with the borehole wall, and we just test mud. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. No worries. Great presentation. When probers doing tests, what have you done? Are this experience and how do you bring that to solve it? Okay, so I'm going to talk about it from an analysis point of view. When the probe bursts, we lose the cavity contraction data. So we are running slightly blind. And um, we can still do the analysis, but to understand where the origin is is more of a challenge because we don't have contraction data to base our strength off. We're working a bit blind. We can apply different techniques, but we lose confidence in particularly strength and in situ stress data if we properly burst the membrane. We can, the membrane can slip out the clamps as well. So we can have things called a membrane slip. And then when the pressure is reduced, it can actually connect back into the clamps basically. So you just have a, a big loss of pressure rather than a complete rupture. Um, but from an analysis point of view, it's my challenge is getting better data out without contraction data. I'm not sure if Stuart's on the line still and could unmute himself, but I'm sure he could talk about the challenges he had. Yeah. Um, yeah, the challenges he had while testing on site and what's your hardest membrane rupture experience um, and how did you solve it? Can you all hear me, or is it is is that okay? Or yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, the biggest problem I had was I was working in Japan last uh, last year, and every single test for the first three weeks, I think it was, burst. So we didn't get to any sort of tangible data. Um, coincide that with one of the bursts um, was that violent. It um, disrupted the um, uh, the PCB um, with all the electronics. So I've spoken to our boss about this and it's the, actually the only time ever in testing where the uh, circuit board has actually ruptured from testing. And it just so happened to be nine hours ahead on a different continent. Um, the issue being that is the last thing that any, you, you troubleshoot everything to see what's going on. And that is the last thing that you troubleshoot. And it's the only thing that you don't take spares because it, because it has never happened on site ever before. Um, it took us about four or five days to work out that that was it. We managed to overnight um, a, a new circuit board from Cambridge to Japan um, and it got there next day. I had it up and running within the next 12 hours and ready on site again. And as far as I'm aware, that's the fastest anyone's managed to resolder, re-establish a probe from nothing and get it ready to work. It wasn't pretty, 
but it worked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it did. And all of those bursts happened because we were specifically testing fractured ground. Um, so we were testing horrible material um, that we don't normally test in, but that's what they needed. So that's why we were out there. I've also had a sec another one where the probe itself has been stuck down the hole. We were testing in sands in London and um, it was it was kind of blowing sand. So the sands were coming up into the borehole and they just over the time of the test, it collapsed on top of the, the pressure meter itself. And try as we might with the rig, it um, it just wouldn't budge. So we had to cut the umbilical cord and then drill over the, the HPD as gently as a drilling rig will possibly go. And uh, try and, and then recover it and see what damage we had after that. But uh, yeah. the Japan was definitely more stressful. Yeah. So yeah, there's selection of pressure meters. They're not a cheap tool, um, and there is a selection scattered around the world, still in the ground, with stuff like drilling rigs, like the Mamba clamps broke on the drill rig, um, and the pressure meter plunged seventy meters down below London. Um, <clears throat> and was never recovered. Robert, who is the principal engineer at our company, lost not one, but two pressure meters in the same fault um, in, I think, Switzerland. So as long as you don't do that, you're in no trouble at all. <laughs> Sorry, something more technical rather than horror stories. So in layered rock masses, you won't, we won't test, we need with HPD, the, we need at least probably a meter of more like 70 centimeters actually of the same material to test. So we, if it's slightly different mudstones, that's okay. But if it is, say, I know this doesn't happen in geology, but say a granite and then maybe, or maybe a kaolinite layer. So granite, kaolinite layer, granite. If you've got something like that, we can't test and they're only 0.3 of a meter thick. We can't test that because you're gonna get membrane bulges so the membrane, rather than being a straight line, is going to end up with like a pocket like this, and it's just going to rupture. Um, and also, I don't think we could actually rationalise that. So mathematically, because we've only got sensors in one, we've got them on one plane. Um, we've not got them spaced out at the top, the middle and the bottom of the probe, for example. So we can't, we can't see what the stiff stuff's doing at the top the soft stuff in the middle and the stiff stuff at the bottom we just can't we can't make sense of it so we don't we don't like testing <laughs> very very variable very interbedded material it just we can't do it uh, can, I, can i ask a question yes yeah this is uh derek martin jasmine Oh, hello, uh, Derek. <laughs> uh, great presentation, by the way. I was wondering if you could uh, pull up your example of uh, elastic rock. And I just. Yep, give me a moment. Yeah. Would you like the zoomed in view? I think I know what your question is going to be as well. No, it's uh, well, I mean, it's it's more. Um, so when you. Uh, you do these routine uh, creep uh, tests. <coughs> yeah, pressure helps. Be there. Yeah. So uh, is this real creep or is this a combination of probe creep or membrane creep or is it, do you believe it to be rock creep? So I, it's not proper creep because in my brain, proper creep is what I describe as like a secondary creep behavior Whereas, which needs more time than, these holds are only 60 seconds long. Um, so it's an instantaneous creep. Um, we do test the probe 
for creep and the membrane for creep. Um, and we don't really see significant amounts of creep. The amounts of creep we see in a rock test here, we see like we see very small amounts if we see them. Um, so I'd say this is mostly rock creep. And I'd say actually what we're seeing is multiple tensile failures really. Um, it's the combination of lots of little micro cracks growing and damage the rock mass more than true creep, I guess. Mm -hmm. Do you, does that make sense? Yeah, because uh, the, uh, the amount of creep say below 10,000 kPa seems to be considerably less than the amount of creep above 10,000. Yeah, so, like, yeah, right. yeah. I think it's the cracking that's causing that creep to occur rather than true creep. Right. So it's really just the tensile cracks propagating and not necessarily creep of the matrix. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think, yeah. And what we use these creep holds for, if you look at the plot on the right here, um, these are all the creep holds plotted up um, for a different test, um, which, and we're looking, so we've got, you can see how the creep's quite high below about three MPA. And I think that's probably micro cracking damage during coring um, and the probe getting itself comfortable in the pocket. Um, but then we do see regular stepping of, we see the creep decreasing and then jumping to increase if we're getting that true tensile behavior. Um, but yeah, here in that example, it's, it's a mudstone. So I'm, I'm pretty sure it's just, yeah, crack growth really. Right, yeah. Okay, thank I, you. Yeah, I thought you were gonna ask me about system stiffness. No, I'll leave that for another time. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna run away from that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. Okay, we don't have final question from Toby. Um, on the initial loading curve, given a number of tasks in similar material, can you get an indication of both of the surface? And uh, is there any hope of investigating any copy with pressure missing tasks? I'll do the anisotropy first. In situ stress anisotropy, yes, um, we've done some work in rock or quite a lot of work in rock. Um, and you can look at the stiffness, how, the, how during the unload reload cycles on different axes, the stiffness varies because that's the cleanest data. So using that clean data and you can look at your, you can't get your in situ stress magnitudes, but you can get the relationship. So between your major and minor horizontal stress, if you're in a soil structure, which you know has anisotropic stress conditions. Um, we've dabbled with a little bit of work of anisotropic stiffness conditions, but we don't, we don't really get, we haven't been asked it recently. Um, so I can't, I can't really comment. <laughs> um, what was the other part? Sorry. Um, oh, sorry, I've managed to stop screen sharing. Could someone? I was just, I just want to, I've got a here's one I prepared earlier slide. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's Colin here. You can, you can forget about that last question. The first question and the answer was really what I was after. So it looks like we ran out of time here. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you, great presentation. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, thank you everyone for being here. Those were all the questions. It was an excellent presentation. I guess it was the best beginning for our seminar and we are, uh, and we are looking forward to see you next week with another excellent and exciting presentation. Thank you.